It seems we are seeing cases with crimes against children increase year over year. Sometimes they are crimes committed by strangers, and sometimes they are even committed by family members. Unfortunately, in the cases where the crime is committed by a family member, we usually see that it is a crime stemming from neglect or selfishness and cruelty of an unfit parent, similar to Casey Anthony or Letitia Stout. In other cases, more darker and sinister cases, we see the crime stemming from something much darker, like religion, rituals, or even exorcisms, which we saw with Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. And today's case aligns with those darker cases. Its evil and darkness goes so deep that it left investigators and family members speechless. And right when they thought that they had all the answers and everything figured out, there was another curveball that nobody saw coming. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Go ahead and smash that like button, hit subscribe if you haven't, and let's get into it. 10 to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. Latarsha Latrice Sanders is a 43-year-old woman of two adorable little boys, 5-year-old Lasan Brito and 8-year-old Edson Marlon Brito. The boys were not only siblings, but best friends. Being so close in age, they did everything together. They were their family's whole world. But that all changed on Monday, February 5th, 2018, when their mother, Latarsha, ran outside of her third-story apartment and asked a neighbor to call 911 because she was having a medical issue. The neighbor complied, and when police arrived around 12.07 a.m., Latarsha was outside of the home and was extremely distraught and combative. Even though Latarsha had been the one to ask that neighbor to call 911, she was seen kicking and screaming when leaving on the stretcher. Screaming, kicking, you know, in, on the stretcher. They put her on the ambulance. I guess they tried to calm her down and then they, they took off. While Latarsha was taken to a local hospital to be evaluated, police decided to have a quick look inside the home to make sure that nobody else needed any help or medical attention in the home because that neighbor that had called told them that two children lived there. And that's when police discovered this horrific scene. Police found the deceased bodies of five-year-old Lasan and eight-year-old Edson Brito. Both of the children were found deceased, laying in their beds in separate rooms. When investigators found Edson, his head and torso were covered with sheets, but his legs were exposed. When they found Lasan, he was under a blanket with his neck bandaged and his face seemingly slashed. Upon first glance, it seemed that Edson had suffered more stab wounds. Latarsha was taken by ambulance to Good Samaritan Medical Center in Brockton before the kids were discovered, but then she was soon taken to the Brockton police station where she immediately began giving conflicting stories and just rambling on and on. At first, she was pinning the blame on this double murder on her teenage son. Then she said that it was her teenage daughter and her father. Then she claimed it was the two boys' father. She was just switching stories left and right and rambling and nobody could make sense of anything. And then finally, she began to confess that she was the one behind this. She claimed, though, to have only stabbed Edson and said that nobody was supposed to get hurt. But then Latarsha soon started to go into more depth, telling police that she stabbed Edson on the legs and in the chest with a kitchen knife, but that she failed a ritual, which was what caused her to then move on to little Lasan. She also told police that she mopped up all of the blood that was on the floor, finally taking responsibility for what had happened and giving investigators answers, or answers they believed to be true. Investigators were later able to find the exact mop that was used. She told investigators that she used a kitchen knife on both boys, and then she also left that knife in the sink. First responders were able to confirm with the police that the murder weapon was in fact found in the sink of the home. And the last thing she told police was that she cleaned up both the children and laid them on their separate beds. Um, well, you know, obviously, if, they were, if they, the kids were in danger, then there was a responsibility and accountability of other, act, other agencies to act. I'm not aware of any right now, but that, once again, remains to be seen. We're going to continue to look into that. You're saying the brothers were dead in the house for up to 48 hours before she received help, before she came out today and told the neighbor to call 911? It's my understanding that the, 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 the children were in the home for approximately 48 hours we believe it to be deceased that entire time period. Were they stabbed more than once? 
Well, I, I said multiple, and I'm going to leave it at that at this point. Um, like I said, I think we're better off waiting for the medical examiner's office to give us the specifics, uh, <laughs> the location of the stabs, and also you know, the manner of means of death that we're going to need in order to prosecute the case. Did she tell a neighbor to call 911? How did it all play out this afternoon? Well, my understanding is is that you know we're not. I'm not going to get into specifics of it, but that she did leave her apartment as a result of this. A neighbor did make a phone call, and that led to the Brockton police and fire and EM EMT so to show up the place. How did she leave her apartment? How did she leave it? Correct. Um, the reports that she walked out the door, jumped out the window. I don't, I don't know. That's still part of the investigation. Was she upset? One of the neighbors described her as hysterical. Yeah, and I, I don't have any comment on what the neighbors had to say. Like I said, we're going to continue to do our investigation and find out what we can as best as we can and try to put the, the event together in the totality that we can. Um, and uh, we'll let the, uh, whatever the neighbors have to say, we'll certainly be talking to them and we're going to conduct our, our, our case as we see for it. Yeah, Coos, you mentioned earlier that there was another child, at least one other child, living there. Have you been able to locate that child? Is that child safe? My understanding is that any other children that belong in that building are safe. Did the children live in that apartment with their mother? The two decedents? Yes. My understanding is they did live there. Is the father aware or anywhere in the picture? We, we, have, uh, we have had conversations with the family uh, regarding uh, the, what's happened there at, the, the, at Prospect Street. Uh, my understanding is he's, he's aware of what's going on. Were the brothers asleep at the time, can you tell, or was there a struggle? I, I don't know. I think, I think it will be indicative as to what the ME has to say on that. But did you say that they found in their bedrooms in their bed at the time? Or? I, you know, I, I don't have the specifics as to where they were actually located, except for the fact that they were in the apartment. Okay. Are there any other questions? Spelling on mom's name. Um, first name L A T A R S H A Sanders S A N D E R S. Latasha L Sanders. Any criminal record on her in the past? Uh, I don't have any information on that regarding her record. Any record that she may have, we'll certainly be dealing with that tomorrow at the hearing. Did she have what any current name? or past position with the city, whether it be for the mayor or anybody here? Do you know about that? Not, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. All right. Do you have your date of birth? Her date of birth is uh, 8 9 74. All right. Thank you all for coming. A preliminary swab test for the presence of blood on her hands also confirmed the presence of human blood. And the boys, for as injured as they were, um, had very little um, blood on them. It appeared as though their clothes had been changed. They were wrapped in clean sheets and placed in separate beds. So what had happened here? How had this mother, not only of Edson and Lasan, but a total of five children, become so wicked and evil that she could so brutally take the lives of her own children? Also, blaming this murder in the beginning on her other children. And what was about to be discovered would shock investigators and spin this case on its head entirely. When Latarsha was asked why she could have done such a thing, she claimed that it was because of voodoo stuff. When investigators started asking Latarsha more questions, especially those related to voodoo, she began slowly opening up. She told investigators that she had failed the ritual with Edson and that because of her failing, she had to move on to Lasan. She even went as far as telling police that neither boy had screamed during their final moments. A heartbreaking and awful detail. Her story did change a bit, though, throughout this interrogation. She said at one point that she was motivated by this so-called voodoo stuff and that it was part of a ritual. Then she claimed at another time that it was because of her daughter and that her daughter wanted a little blood. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Scott Croto, reporter from Mass Live giving an update on a very terrible situation that happened in Brockton. Yesterday, um, yesterday afternoon, Brockton authorities were called to an apartment on Prospect Street, and they discovered the body of uh, two boys, ages five and eight, inside the home. What we've learned today is the mother, Latarsha Sanders, age 43, uh, was charged in, the, in their killings. Uh, she was brought to court today in Brockton uh, in charge with two counts of murder. What she told authorities was she had attacked her two sons, again, ages five and eight, as part of some kind of ritual. Uh, they haven't really said um, if it's what kind of ritual it is. Uh, she made some indication that it might have been voodoo. Uh, the prosecutor in the case uh, had said they're not really sure uh, if there was some religious beliefs around that or some ritual. 
But what she had told authorities was she set upon one of her children and uh, began stabbing him, uh, according to reports from uh, other media outlets. She had attacked this child, and the ritual had, quote, unquote, failed. So she then set upon her other son and, uh, and started attacking him. Oddly enough, just one week earlier, two sisters in East Bridgewater were arraigned on charges of torturing a five-year-old girl and eight-year-old boy in what the kid's mother described to police as a voodoo cleansing ritual that was meant to ward off evil spirits. Now, having these two insane acts of violence within one week of each other, all in the name of voodoo, voodoo practitioners and academics made it very clear to the public that the religion does not at all condone violence, torture, human sacrifices, or anything of the kind. Latarsha's family says that she was into voodoo and was obsessed with the idea of the Illuminati. Latarsha's own mother, Erline Sanders, told police that she believes Latarsha is mentally unstable and, quote, crazy. She said that within the last two years, rituals, numerology, and sacrifices went from being an interest of hers to being an obsession. Her mother said that she refused to get any mental health evaluations or treatment. She claimed that after watching a YouTube video, she became so fascinated and paranoid with the Illuminati and secret societies that she began doing over-the-top things, such as spying on her neighbors through a baby monitor. Erline said that on the Friday before the murders, she showed up at her doorstep going on and on about the Illuminati and even accused her of killing her father and told her, the devil has you. Erline told police that she was also yelling about how she couldn't stand her teenage son and was threatening to kill him and put his body in a freezer. According to Erline, she showed up again the very next day on Saturday, just two days before the bodies were found. She showed up with the two boys and her 16-year-old daughter and was rambling about human sacrifice and saying that she needed to kill someone so that she could obtain a human heart to give to her dying father. She allegedly was also still threatening to kill her teenage son. She told her mother that the two boys were sick, even though they seemed to be in perfectly good health and good condition. And she says that they were so sick and that she was going to take them to the hospital. Her mother then said that she left in a rush and stopped answering her phone calls completely. She had also left her 16-year-old daughter with her mother when she left, leaving her alone on the road with her two young boys. And that was the last time anyone saw the boys alive. She didn't return on Sunday to pick up her daughter and continued to ignore her mother's texts and phone calls. On Monday morning, just an hour and a half before the bodies were found, Latarsha came back to her mother's house. Erline claimed that Latarsha was continuing to yell at her and accused her once again of killing her father and even went as far as hitting her. Her mother described her eyes as being black and glassy, and when she asked where the boys were, Latarsha told her, none of your effing business. The medical examiner believes that based on their wounds, that the boys were killed on Saturday, more than likely after Latarsha had left her mother's home. Despite Latarsha's claims of rituals and sacrifices, District Attorney Timothy Cruz told reporters that they are not certain what caused Latarsha to commit such evil acts, and that there was no clear evidence that her actions were motivated by religious beliefs. And he commented saying, we believe, based on her comments, that she was involved in some sort of rituals that she believed in. Suffice it to say, it's something she referred to throughout her life to other people in her family, or at least for the last couple of years. We don't have a lot of clarity to a lot of things she was saying at this point. Despite his comment on the motive, it is very clear where he stands on the case. He told reporters she cleaned blood. The weapon was found in the sink of the kitchen of the home. It was also cleaned up. That's all the information you need to look at it and make a determination as to whether or not somebody was able to make competent, rational decisions at the time that they were trying to cover their tracks. Well, I think you'll, you'll have to look at the steps you know, for pre-crime pre as well as post-crime to make a determination as to whether or not somebody is competent and or criminally responsible. Those are the things you look at, and those are things that we'll continue to look at to see what was done prior to this event and also what was done after, and the entire history as best as we can put together regarding what's been going on with this family. Can you talk a little bit about those steps that you took afterwards? Well, what, what obviously, as we stated in court, she cleaned blood up, she was, she was cleaning uh, the, the, the weapon was found in the in the sink of the kitchen of the home, also cleaned up. I mean, that is all 
information that you need to look at to make a determination as to whether somebody was able to make competent and rational decisions at the time that they were trying to cover their tracks, so to speak. We were learning more about the details. 50, five, zero stab wounds to the eight-year-old. It's unimaginable. A little boy, uh, innocent little boy who stabbed 50 times is never... Uh, it's tough to get your arms around that one. Really. Latarsha's arraignment took place on Tuesday, February 6, 2018. The autopsy results came back during the time of the arraignment, and it was found that Edson was stabbed 76 times. He also had more than 20 cuts and scratches on him. Lasan was stabbed 23 times, and he had around 80 superficial wounds. During the arraignment, Latarsha's attorney, Joseph Krauske, asked in court for the bail to be set without prejudice so that the full bail argument could take place in the future. Assistant DA Jessica Kenny shared new information in court that investigators had discovered a journal in Latarsha's car. In this journal was a list of New Year's resolutions from the previous year. In it, she claimed that she wanted to make a GoFundMe page for everyone in the family and noted next to it, that the best story gets the best money. She also wrote in the list that she wanted to open a P.O. box for her quote-unquote fan mail. Latarsha is seen acting very surprised when she hears this information. An assistant DA, Jessica Kenny, said that she believes that this could have been her mindset and motive for this crime. Opening GoFundMe accounts for everyone in the family with a notation that the best story gets the best money. There's also an indication that she wanted to open a P.O. box so that she could, quote, receive fan mail. Latarsha pled not guilty in Brockton District Court to the charges of murdering her two sons, and she was held without bail. Court documents showed that the family's home life was already fairly exposed to violence and financial instability, although there was no record of Latarsha herself ever committing any acts of violence towards her kids. In 2014, Latarsha got two restraining orders against the father of the two boys, whose name is also Edson Brito, claiming that he was an abusive alcoholic. He was arrested multiple times for assaulting Latarsha and her older son. One incident allegedly showed that in 2014, he pushed and threatened her, causing the police to respond to the couple's apartment, finding Latarsha holding a crying Lasan on her lap, and then five-year-old Edson, who told police, that's him, pointing to his father. The case, however, was dismissed. Then Edson Brito was arrested again in July 2014 after allegedly shoving Latarsha's teenage son. That case was also dismissed. The 36-year-old father of Edson and Lasan was living in the apartment with Latarsha and the boys until January 2017, when he was arrested on drug charges, disturbing the peace, and resisting arrest. Although Edson Brito had a three-page criminal history report at the district court, investigators say that they have investigated him thoroughly and do not believe he had any involvement in these murders. The father of Latarsha's teenage son claimed that he believed her erratic behavior extended back to more than two decades. He claimed he was romantically involved with her in 1999 and that she had anger problems. He claimed that on one occasion, she allegedly slapped him and broke every window in his car, causing him to be so scared of her that he immediately left and drove all the way home with no windows in his car. He claimed that in recent years, he has tried to avoid her completely because she often demanded money in addition to the child support that he was already paying. Even though he claimed she was erratic, he too said that he never believed she was capable of violence towards her children. The state's Department of Children and Family Services had some involvement with the family in 2014 when the police officer filed a report with the agency on behalf of the teenage son. This report more than likely came from the incidents that happened in 2014 with the family. But other than that, there was no recent involvement with the family concerning the children. A vigil was held for the boys not long after their deaths. So many people showed up to support the boys and their family. The vigil was held at the apartment complex that the family lived in and hundreds of locals came to pay their respects to the boys. 27-year-old Shayla Sanders, one of Latarsha's older children, spoke at the vigil through tears, saying, this lady in this picture is not my mother. I don't know who the lady in this picture is. Shaylee further said, They came over every other day. We'd go down the street to the park. I loved them. It's just hard for me too. I'm still thinking they're upstairs, waiting for me to bring my dog upstairs. It's not real to me right now. I'm thinking they're here. They're my brothers, my mother. I don't know. 
Other family members were present and told a few reporters that Latarsha truly was a loving mother, but that at some point she had just lost her way. The vigil was led by Bishop-elect Orlando Harris of the New Life Christian Church in Brockton. He took the time to speak to the crowd on the importance of taking action if you notice a loved one is acting strangely. He told the crowd, My charge to you is to do me a favor. If you ever see or hear about some strange behaviors going on with me or my family, call someone, check on me, and I'm going to do the same thing. If you see anything going on that's in your opinion not right, we ask, don't ignore it. He also denounced the practice of voodoo and received cheers from the crowd. However, let's not forget, voodoo practitioners do not at all encourage or condone this behavior. It seems truly that there were some unchecked mental health issues that led Latarsha down this slippery slope of evil. The boy's father also spoke at the vigil. He described his pain to the crowd, saying, There's so much grief, so much pain. I'm never going to wait for my son to get out of his school bus. Never, never. Or to ask him how was his day. Other family members spoke to reporters, and all of them claimed that there were no apparent signs that she would have ever done this to her children. I don't know. I can't think of anything that would drive a mom to do that to the kids, you know? Was just there horrible. any signs of problems? No signs, you know, nothing at all. My brother said there were no signs at all, you know. A funeral was held at a local church for the two boys, where many family members and friends attended. Their father gave a speech about the two of them and how much he loves and misses them. He is also seen at one point sobbing over their caskets. This is so sad. Really, really so sad. But I'm just going to cherish every memory of you. Latarsha is still awaiting trial due to COVID-19 delays, as well as her mental health status. With the trial coming up, the boy's older sister, Tamia Sanders Brito, tells reporters, I don't want anyone to forget about them. They were so happy, joyful, and energetic. Tamia says that she did notice a decline in her mother's mental health leading up to the murders, but that she didn't think anything of it because she was only 16 years old herself. She also says that the murders were truly such a shock to everyone in the family, and that while she was growing up, Latarsha was nothing but a caring and loving mother to her. Tamia stated, all of my childhood memories of my mom were good. She always cared for us, made sure we were eating and had clothing, and always put us before herself. Then if we needed or wanted something, she would get it for us. Now, most interestingly, Tamia does not believe that the claim of her mother performing a voodoo ritual is true and believes that the murders were a result of bad mental health saying, my family does not practice voodoo. We have never practiced voodoo. I've never seen my mom do voodoo in my life. We are a Christian family that used to go to church together. Tamia told this to reporters recently on November 16th. But in regards to the journal and the claim that Latarsha did it for fame and money, Tamia said, my mom did have a book she was writing crazy stuff in. I don't know if she was just writing her thoughts out during a mental health episode or what, but it wasn't an old notebook. It was a new one, a more recent one. I think the journal shows her mental health was rapidly declining. Tamia said that she does still keep in contact with her mother, though the conversations between them are fairly brief. Tamia, as well as another one of her siblings, said that they chose to opt out of testifying against their mother and are planning to write the judge a letter on behalf of their mother. Tamia told reporters she did what she did and she's going to pay for it, but something went wrong in her brain. Something went horribly wrong and she needs help. This case puzzles me and has puzzled the community because while it seems one thing in her journal that she was doing this for fame and money for a GoFundMe, possibly to set up the rest of the children, who knows? Another piece is this whole voodoo thing and the crime happening within a week of another voodoo crime happening in the nearby town. So... It's interesting because with the church, with her family members, with everybody close to her denouncing that this had anything to do with voodoo or anything related to any sort of religion, it would seem like a fairly large coincidence that not only is Latarsha herself confessing to investigators that this was a voodoo ritual gone wrong, but also one had taken place that same week across town. So did they just not know that she was practicing? Is there common practice amongst the community and even within the church because we know the bishop had said something about voodoo as well and is it trying to be you know a kind of kept secret within the town what really is the root here these murders were either committed due to a break in her mental health 
due to her truly believing in voodoo and rituals and Illuminati like her mother said she became so obsessed with over the last few years, or this was done for fame and money, as outlined in her journal. I don't believe that all three of those things tie together to create the perfect storm, so which path is the truth? I'm guessing that during the trial and as more evidence is released and as we truly see uh, all the journal in front of us, we'll be able to get a better understanding, but I'm curious to know what you guys think. Let me know in the comments below. Her mom also described her eyes as being dark and glassy, so I can't help but see the parallels between this and Lori Vallow, as though something overcame these people, not saying that they're not at fault, they certainly are, but as though something brainwashed them, overcame them to truly believe that these children were zombies like Lori or evil like this case. So what is it that grasps such a hold of these women that we see primarily women, such a grasp and such a hold to where they inflict this on their own children? Is it religion or is it something deeper? Let me know what you guys think below. Thanks again for tuning in with me today, guys. I will keep you updated. Please don't forget, give this video a thumbs up on your way out and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already by hitting that red subscribe button because it is a completely free way to show support for the channel. All right, guys, thanks again. And until the next one, stay safe. Bye.